Okay. Good. Yep, we are going. Well, thank you for joining this School of Living Zoomcast. School of Living's mission as a nonprofit educational organization is to explore challenges of living, hold land and trust for present and future generations, promote personal empowerment, and support the development of just and sustainable communities. We appreciate your support for the work of School of Living through your participation here tonight and through your generous donations. If you wish to consider becoming an active member of School of Living, donate to School of Living or subscribe to our newsletter, please go to schoolofliving.org. And I'll put that link into the chat box um, before the end of the night. So we're really happy to have April here today. Um, she runs Nettle Juice Herbals and we'll put her website on the chat box as well. Um, and she'll be introducing those herbs that are right around in our yards and doorsteps and um, let us know how we can use them in this uh, beautiful springtime. Um, she's been working with plant medicine for t over 20 years and making medicine and connecting with her community um, and teaching classes and, and, and. And she grows these plants in her own garden, which is uh, around the corner from us. We have the good fortune of having her as a neighbor, um, which I'll tell a story. Um, there was a time was about two years, no, three years, three years ago. And I had a little accident and lost the end of my thumb. Four years ago? No. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we quickly got that end of the thumb reattached um, and it was questionable whether it was going to survive um, or if I was gonna have to kind of amputate part of that thumb off. Um, it was pretty disturbing. Uh, so I asked um, April if she had any ideas of how I could help myself heal. And um, you gave me one medicine that helped the blood flow and I cannot remember the name of that remedy and I used that, but she also pointed me to um, a, a plant that grows in the wild called yarrow and told me to make a strong tea with it, uh, let it cool and just soak my thumb in it. And that made me feel really good. Um, and, and I looked forward to those treatments. It seemed to just cool everything down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's back. <laughs> so I'm very grateful to, to April for that. And I think she can give us some more information about these plants. So thank you, April. Hey, yours. thanks, Michael Ann. Um, thanks everyone for coming. I'm April. I, I know some of you, I know many of you. Um, good to see you again. Um, I, I was telling Michael Ann before you all joined that it's really, um, it's kind of cool for me to be here today because I was very involved with the School of Living about 20 years ago um, and went to some of these educational events myself at different um, communities that they are a part of. And, um, and now here I am coming back full circle. So I'm very honored and, and thankful to be here. I am excited to share some of my favorite springtime tonic plants with you all today. And I have a slideshow prepared. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you all. Uh, okay. So, it's, this is always um, one of my favorite topics to teach about in herbalism, to talk about the, the springtime tonics that come up this time of year, because a lot of these plants are what we like to call weeds. They're nuisance plants that come up in our gardens and um, many people try to get rid of them in various ways and um, don't really talk about them in friendly terms. And I love to change people's opinions about them. Not that any of you will be changed. I think you're all very weed friendly in this group, but, um, but it, is, it is something that, that I like to, to change people's opinions about because I don't like thinking about plants as bad. 
Um, I didn't grow up um, learning about the healing plants. I grew up in a family that was pretty much better living through chemistry mindset and spray everything that isn't a rose <laughs> that's growing around you. Um, so I didn't have any concept of plants as medicine at all. And um, it wasn't until it was in my early 20s and I was working in a health food store that um, I realized that some of the herbs that people were coming in to buy were things that we used to call weeds and they were bad. Um, and it was a mind blowing experience for me. It really cracked me open and I wanted to learn more about these plants and the idea that wild plants growing in our yards were medicine and were good for us just um, blew my mind and I went down that rabbit hole and never really came back out again and here I am just making it my whole life all these years later so a little bit about me if you don't know um, who I am my name is April I'm a community herbalist um, living in southern Chester County Pennsylvania right around the corner from Michael Ann I've been studying herbs since the mid 1990s. My first teacher was Rosemary Gladstar, um, who's in this picture here with me. Um, and I've had many other teachers since then, um, Susan Hess, Ashley Ellenboss, and my current teacher is Thomas Easley at the Eclectic School of Herbal Medicine, where I'm studying to be a clinical herbalist right now. I teach classes here in my um, community and also online um, and also write about herbs online too. So that's a little bit about me. And now we'll get into a whole lot about the plants, which is why you're all here. So all of the plants I'm going to be talking about tonight are considered spring tonics, um, which basically means they were turned to by people in traditional cultures as um, springtime cleansing plants to take into our system at this time of year to help rejuvenate and cleanse. Um, and they're all plants as well that are easily found growing in the wild um, around this area this time of year without much effort. So, um, so in the early spring, some of the first plants to start growing in our yards and surrounding areas are not only wild edibles, but some of the best medicine emerging for emerging from the cold, dark winter months. The animals know how to make use of these plants and indigenous cultures around the world have their local traditions of spring tonics as well. So by getting to know the spring tonics growing around us, we can begin to reclaim this traditional knowledge and also have a connection with the land which is a beautiful thing. Um, just before we get started, a couple terms just to clear up the definition of. Um, these plants will fall into the category that herbalists like to refer to as either tonics or alteratives. So tonics are plants that have a toning effect on the tissues of the body. They strengthen our system when taken over time. Um, An alternative is an old herbal term that traditionally it meant blood cleanser. Um, we don't really talk about blood cleansers anymore because we don't talk about cleaning the blood. Um, that's really an old concept, but these herbs known as alternatives, they all worked in different ways and with different um, organs or body systems, but they all have the effect of either helping us to assimilate nutrients more efficiently or eliminate toxins and waste from the body more efficiently. So um, when we think about the effect of those two processes, um, what we have is a category of plants that cleanses and builds, right? And so that's a wonderful thing to have at the change of the season when we move into a more active time of year, especially. And uh, when we take advantage of what nature has to offer in this season, we connect with the land, we connect with the season cycles, we connect with our own natural rhythm and the plants that are available in the early spring are just what our bodies need 
when we're coming out of winter, inactivity, heavy foods, possible illness that we've had, um, you know, and just reconnecting with the wisdom of nature and what she has to offer this time of year. So before I get started with the individual plants, um, just some precautions. Um, if you um, are harvesting wild plants that you're not growing yourself, always make sure that you have a 100% positive identification. You, there's no question. There are poisonous plants out there. Um, not too many lookalikes for what I'm gonna be talking about today, but still you definitely wanna have a positive identification. Make sure the area you're harvesting from hasn't been sprayed with chemicals. Um, get permission from the landowner if it's not your land. Always leave more than you take. Never harvest at risk plants. None of the plants we're gonna be talking about today are at risk, um, um, but good to know anyway. Ask permission. And in this case, I'm talking about the plant itself. Ask permission of the plant and give thanks. Um, it's nice to remember that these are living beings um, and get to know each individual plant and the best harvesting practices for that plant. So I'm gonna be talking about harvesting the plants um, that we'll go over today. And the first one is dandelion. So I always start with dandelion. Um, His dandelion is just so wonderful. Um, and dandelion is, the poster child for, you know, the noxious weed in our culture too, right? Even literally on advertisements for chemical herbicides is the dandelion. And it's always amusing to me to contemplate how something that almost every child finds joy in, not only the dandelion flowers, but the dandelion seed heads and blowing them and just the joy that that brings to children, how we grow up and become adults who hate this plant so much. <laughs> it's, it's kind of ironic. Um, but dandelion was brought to North America on purpose because of how valued it was both as food and medicine. So it's here because we wanted it here. And the fact that it's so vilified now just shows how far we've gotten away from our traditions. And that dandelion can even survive at all in our, our lawns is only for the reason that we, we mow our lawns all the time because this plant really can't compete with other taller plants. So if, if we didn't have such a, such a lawn fetish, we probably wouldn't have as many dandelions. But um, dandelion is a wonderful plant. And there's this great story that I like to share um, called Pot of Gold, all about the dandelion. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this story first, because um, stories are wonderful ways to to learn about plants and about each other. So in this story, um, there was a man who happened to find the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, and he was very excited and very happy that he was rich all of a sudden. But the leprechaun came out and said, there's one uh, stipulation. You can take this gold home with you because you did find it but you have to share it with your entire village. Oh, oh, yes, yes, of course, of course, I'll share it with my entire village, he said. And so he put all the gold in a sack and went along his way back home. But as he traveled, he started to think, um, I really don't want to share this gold. After all, I found it, and there's so many things I could do with it. And if I share it with everybody, there'll be less for me. And so he had convinced himself by the time he reached his home that it wasn't a good idea to share it. And in fact, he was going to um, just hide it um, under his bed. And in the morning, he was gonna go out and bury it um, and just keep it for himself. So when he got home, it was almost dark and he just hid it under his bed. Um, well, during the night, a little mouse came out and chewed a little hole in his sack. And in the morning, he got up and he threw 
the bag over his shoulder and just ran out the door before anyone else could wake up so he could go bury his gold really quickly and didn't realize that there was a hole in his sack and little pieces of gold were falling out wherever he went. And when he got to the edge of the woods where he was gonna bury his gold, he realized there wasn't anything left in the bag and he started to panic. And he looked out over the field that he just run across and saw all these little pieces of gold scattered all over the place. And so he went out to start collecting them, but wherever he, whenever he went up to what looked like a piece of gold, he found a dandelion flower. And so what had happened was the leprechaun had turned all of the gold into dandelion flowers so that they couldn't be hoarded and the whole community could benefit from the treasure. So whenever we look at a field of dandelion flowers, we can think of it as, you know, a treasure, a, a golden hoard that we can benefit from. So the leaves of dandelion, dandelion leaves are bitter, um, they're diuretic, they're a kidney tonic, a digestive tonic, um, they're wild edible. We can eat these, we can put them in salads, in stir fries, in soups, any way that you cook dark leafy greens, you can cook dandelion leaves. Dandelion leaves are full of potassium, iron, calcium, phosphorus, vitamins A and C. They can be helpful for bloating, for water retention, indigestion, kidney irritation. Um, and one thing about dandelion greens, because they do have that bitter taste, right? So many um, people in our culture have like shunned bitter from their diet and they're, not, and they're not used to bitter. So when they taste bitter, it's like, eh, you know, they don't really have a taste for it anymore, but bitter is an amazing medicine in and of itself, right? Foods that are bitter, that have that bitter taste, stimulate our bitter taste receptors in our mouth, send the signal down to our digestive system to start secreting gastric juices, start creating more bile, get ready to digest something um, that's a little bit more difficult and challenging to our system. And when we challenge our system a little bit, we make it stronger. And that's where the toning effect comes from. So adding a few dandelion greens to your, to your salads, to your cooked dishes can be amazing as a digestive tonic. Dandelion roots um, are a liver tonic. They are a prebiotic, so they feed our good gut bacteria. Um, we can dry the dandelion roots and make a tea out of them. Um, most roots, when we make teas out of roots, we make a decoction. And that just means that we simmer the roots. Instead of just pouring hot water over them and letting them sit, we actually put them in a pot with water and simmer them for 10 or 15 minutes to get the medicine out. Um, we can make a tincture of the roots. Um, the roots aren't, um, you know, edible in the way the greens are edible, but um, we can harvest the fresh roots and make tea out of them. And that tea is a wonderful springtime tonic. So I always tell people if you're digging dandelion roots out of your garden this time of year to get ready for planting vegetables, you know, eat the greens, save the roots, dry them, make tea out of them. It's good medicine. So. The roots are rich in potassium, they lower cholesterol, lower high blood pressure, reproductive tonic, and then calcium, chromium, magnesium, niacin, potassium, riboflavin, zinc, vitamin C, so much good stuff in those roots. And then even the flowers, dandelion flowers are edible. You can throw them into salads, um, you know, they, they make a beautiful addition to, to raw vegetables. Um, one of the great things about dandelion flower medicine though, is you can infuse the flowers in oil and use that as a massage oil. It's a tension reliever, and it's especially great at helping to release emotions held in the muscles. And we hold emotions in different parts of our body, um, but sometimes, there's emotions that get held in muscles over time and they're really stiff and hard to release. So that's a really great medicine. And even the sap 
of the dandelion, that milky latex sap in the stems can be used to shrink warts when used steadily over time. So every part of this plant is medicine. It really is a wonderful springtime tonic. The next one I have is Archangel. A lot of people like to call this plant purple dead nettle, which is a really strange name to me. It's not um, related to nettles at all, um, but it has a similar leaf shape. In, in England, um, they have the white uh, dead nettle, but it's, it's a very similar plant. We have purple here. And this time of year, this plant is so abundant in this area. The farm fields around here before they're plowed have just swaths of purple in them. Um, and that's just a whole um, horde of purple dead nettle or archangel growing. So this is a mint family plant. It's got the characteristic square stem of the mint family. The leaves are opposite. Um, you know, they tend to grow in clusters up near the top of the stem in, in almost a pyramid shape with bigger leaves at the bottom and smaller leaves at the top. Um, this plant is very drying and toning. It is a wild edible. You can eat this. You can add it to salads, add it to soups and things like that. Um, it's also a great plant for external wounds. Taking this plant in internally this time of year can be really helpful for people who suffer from seasonal allergies. And it's best to, to start now, really, to, um, to get plants in the system if you have allergies um, a month ahead of time. It's also a great reproductive tonic, especially for the uterus. It improves immune function. Externally, it can be used for varicose veins, bruises, and insect bites. Um, and this is what it looks like growing in a group here. Um, so you can harvest this plant and add it to salads, add it to smoothies. You can juice it um, any way you would use a fresh green. Um, it's, its taste isn't... Um, to me, it's not something I would want to eat a whole plate of by myself. Um, I would want to mix it with other things, but it's not unpleasant. One of the things I like to do with Archangel is make an infused vinegar. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about how to do that at the end here, but that's a really neat, nice way to use this plant. Okay, the next one is chickweed. So chickweed is super abundant right now. It's in flower, so it's, it's really easy to identify. This plant loves to grow in the garden as a weed right in your soil. It loves um, really rich, um, friable soil. So a lot of people are pulling this out of their garden beds this time of year. Um, but this is an amazing um, springtime edible that you can add to your salads. Um, we don't have those early lettuces from the farmer's market yet, but we can eat chickweed and it's got that tender, uh, juicy, mild taste, just like lettuce does. Um, so chickweed is a cold season annual. And what that means is it starts its life cycle in the fall and it's really alive all winter. You can even usually find it under the snow, um, still green, not really growing, but just hanging out. And then as soon as the weather warms up, it just bursts forth with, with tons of growth and becomes this really luscious mat of green. Um, if you think you have chickweed, but you're not sure, there's a couple things you can look for. The flowers um, have white petals. And at first glance, it may look like they have 10 petals, but if you look really close, you'll see that they actually have five petals, but they're cleft to look like rabbit ears. So five little rabbit ears going all the way around. The little leaf um, on the plant look like little mouse ears. They're shaped like little mouse ears and they're opposite. And then in between each pair of leaves on the stem, there's a little line of white hair that runs from one set of leaves to the next, just on one side of the stem. So you can look for those three things if you're not sure if you have chickweed. And then once you've identified it, you can eat this plant in your salads, in your smoothies. It's not really great as a cooked 
green, it kind of, it's so tender, it just kind of disintegrates to nothing if you try to cook it, but it is really great as a fresh edible. Um, chickweed is full of saponins. Um, saponins weaken bacteria, and this is a great plant for treating infections and wounds. So I, I have used chickweed so many times on infected wounds, and it's never failed me. And how I do that is if if somebody has a wound and it's starting to get pussy or red and not really healing the way I would like, I'll go out and grab a handful of fresh chickweed, mash it up and get those juices really flowing and then poultice that right over the wound. Um, what will happen is that it will be cooling at first, but as it draws out toxins and bacteria, it will get warm. And then after a couple hours, you can take that off, throw it away and put another poultice on it. So usually within a day or two, um, it's cleared up all the infection and pulled it out. Any other topical red inflamed itchy condition, um, it's great for, it's very cooling, it's mucilant, which means it's um, soothing and moisturizing. It's a mild lymphatic. A lot of these springtime tonic plants are stimulating to our lymphatic system which is really what we need this time of year, especially if we've been kind of sedentary over the winter because our lymphatic system you know, relies on moving our bodies to keep it moving. And these gentle springtime lymphatics just help to clear out waste from the lymphatic system as we move into the more active time of year. Nutrients in chickweed, iron, calcium, magnesium, manganese, silicon, zinc, phosphorus, potassium, copper, um, carotenes, vitamin C. So lots and lots of nutrients in these springtime edibles. Here's a close up of chickweed. Um, as I said, salad greens, smoothies, pesto, poultice for wounds, eye wash. Another way I use this plant is I'll make a tea out of it. I'll strain it out, let it come all the way down to room temperature, and then put it in an eye wash cup for things like conjunctivitis or just irritated eyes for any reason. And I've actually used it to treat conjunctivitis in my kids a couple times over the years, and it's very helpful for that. Helps to bring moisture back to dry, creaky joints. Okay, next one is cleavers. Um, cleavers is a, such a cool plant um, growing this time of year. It's just coming up, my, my cleavers out in the yard are maybe an inch or two high right now, but they're gonna grow really fast. Um, cleavers, you can identify them. They have a long stem and then they have, the leaves grow around the stem in a whirl. So usually six leaves in a whirl and then the flowers are teeny tiny white flowers, but they won't be flowering for a little bit. But how you can identify this plant is it's covered in little tiny hook hairs, which you can see in this picture a little bit. And what these do is they stick to clothes, to fur, um, and they grab on, they cleave is what they do. So if you see another plant that has these leaves in a whirl and you're not sure if this cleavers or not, you can just pick part of it and see if it sticks to your clothes. And if it does, it's cleavers. There are some um, galliums that are not cleavers, but um, that's a pretty good way to identify it. So cleavers is a cooling and drying plant. It's a urinary and lymphatic tonic. So taking it into our bodies this time of year helps to tone our urinary system, helps to tone our lymphatic system. It also helps to calm irritated nerves. Um, and uh, Matthew Wood, an, an herbalist in our community, talks about how the square stem of cleavers with its really sharp edges reminds us of people who, are, who have edges to them, who are on edge all the time or when we're on edge and things easily set us off, cleavers can help to calm us down. Externally, we can use a poultice for swollen lymph nodes and inflammation, but internally we can eat the young shoots. 
So when they're young and tender, um, they're very palatable and they're very mild tasting and we can collect them and add them to salads and smoothies and things like that. As they get older, they get tougher and less palatable um, and we don't really wanna eat them so much anymore, but then we can still make medicine with them. And I even like to take the older um, stems when they get longer and just run them through my juicer and drink the juice. Cleavers are really great for the lymphatic system. They help move out waste and debris, um, things that have accumulated over the winter months and just clear it up. Garlic mustard is another plant that's up this time of year. And this is a great one to harvest because it's considered a, an invasive species and um, you know, it can easily take over an area, but if you are open to eating the wild plants, you can just gather it and eat it and take care of that problem as well. So garlic mustard is warming and stimulating. It is in the mustard family. And the thing about garlic mustard is it's a biennial and it looks a little different depending on the time of its life cycle that it's in. So this is the leaf shape that we see now as those second year plants are coming up. It's got scalloped edges, sort of heart-shaped leaf. And then a little bit later in the season when it sends up its flower stalk, the leaves look a little different. They get lighter in color, they get a little bit more pointy, um, smaller at the top. So different shape leaves, same plant, different time in its life cycle, but still taste pretty much the same. So I've been harvesting garlic mustard and making pestos and putting it into soup. Um, it really is an appropriately named plant it, it does taste like a combination of garlic and mustard. Um, it is very warming and stimulating. It will aid digestion, helps increase circulation. Um, the roots of this plant can actually be dug up and used like horseradish. So they're much smaller than horseradish. They're not the big um, roots that horseradish have, but they are white and they can be chopped up and used um, in the same way as for, they do have a similar taste. Um, but just using the greens is wonderful too. So this is a cool plant. As I said, it's a biennial. So um, the plants that are emerging now are in their second year. They'll be sending up a flower stalk very soon. And then the flowers are edible as well. I'll harvest these and throw them in soups or as garnishes. Um, on salads or pesto or something like that. Um, and then, you know, they'll spread their seeds and die back and then um, come up, uh, you know, following year, they'll come up again. Creeping Charlie, um, also called ground ivy. This is a plant that um, many people who have gardens are very familiar with, even if they don't know what it's called. Um, because it loves to grow in rich garden soil. I realize I'm fading into the darkness here. Ah. Um, so Creeping Charlie is a mint family plant. And <laughs> I have a computer light here that I don't know how to adjust the brightness of, so I'm, I look like I'm really bright. Um, it has a square stem opposite leaves of the of mint family plants and the, you know, the mint family irregular flowers, but um, it's called creeping Charlie and ground ivy because instead of growing upright, it grows along the ground and puts down roots wherever it grows like an ivy plant, right? And so it spreads very quickly, very easily all throughout the garden and gardeners are pulling it out all the time. Um, but this is a really cool plant. It can be used um, as a tea, mostly as a tea, not really as a wild edible, um, but it's helpful for drying up congestion, drying up runny secretions. Um, if you're sick and you have a cold or a fever, it's helpful for opening up your pores, breaking a sweat and bringing the fever to a head. 
But what is most interesting about this plant, I think, is that it was traditionally used for a condition called painter's colic. When um, painters would get sick and we didn't really understand why, this, this plant was used to help them. Nowadays, we know that they were actually suffering from lead poisoning, right? Because the paint had lead in it back then. So what we know about this plant is it helps move lead out of the body. So if somebody has a lead toxicity, um, taking Creeping Charlie as a tea every day can help move that lead out of the body. So you can harvest this, you can make tea with it, you can make a tincture, a vinegar. It doesn't really do well as a dried plant. It loses its vitality pretty quickly once it's dried, um, but it has a long growing season. Um, and I always keep patches of it around in the garden so that I can harvest it when I need it. Um, and here it is growing in abundance in the garden. Um, it, it has an amazing fragrance. So if you're a gardener and you pull this plant out, you, you're very familiar with the fragrance just wafting over you as you pull it out, as most mint family plants do. Okay, red clover. Um, red clover is in the legume family. The flowers and the leaves are edible. Um, the flowers make a beautiful addition to salads. Um, it's cooling, it's a lymphatic. Clover is good for respiratory conditions, can be helpful for spasmodic cough, whooping cough. Uh, clover is a phytoestrogen. Um, Maybe a good idea to avoid during pregnancy, but um, other than that, it's pretty safe, full of antioxidants, full of vitamin E, anti-tumor compounds. Many, many cultures around the world have included clover in their treatments for cancer. So herbalists are often very hesitant to talk about herbs for cancer. It's, it's kind of a touchy subject, but traditionally um, red clover has been, been used um, by, by many cultures as a, as a cancer treatment. Jethro Kloss in his book, Back to Eden, tells the story of when he was a kid, um, their mail carrier um, developed stomach cancer and his mother had all the children go out and harvest red clover flowers to give to their mail carrier and he would drink it every day and um, he recovered. So he tells that story. Red clover um, is helpful for hot flashes during perimenopause calcium, magnesium, and niacin. And it's also helpful after giving birth to help um, women recover their strength. So we collect the flowers as they are ripe on the plant. Um, the one thing to be careful about when harvesting clover is you don't wanna harvest this plant when it's wet at all. So, when it's, um, and I, when I say harvest it, I mean harvest it for drying. If you're gonna be eating it, it's fine to harvest wet. You definitely don't want, don't want to harvest moldy plants, but if you're gonna dry this plant to preserve it, you want to make sure it's completely dry, that all the dew has evaporated, it's not a Okay, we, we need to hold on for a moment. Uh, the April's connection just went bad. Uh, we're going to try and get it reestablished. Hang on.
April is back. I'm back. <laughs> so I'll let you proceed and resume. Apparently, we lost her again from the looks of it. I don't know if you can hear April. Um, okay, so red clover, good for respiratory conditions. You can harvest the flowers to add to salads to eat as an edible green. The leaves are edible too. You can also harvest the flowers to make tea out of and drink the tea. You can dry the flowers and have red clover tea all year round. Um, yeah, so I think what I was saying when I left was that um, you wanna make sure that the flowers are completely dry if you're going to be preserving them because there's a mold that can grow on the red clover that acts as a blood thinner. Um, so making sure that the flowers are completely dry when you harvest them, that they don't have any mold on them and that you dry them really well so that they're not wet at all when they're stored is really important. But the red clover itself is, is very safe. Okay, Persian speedwell is another um, springtime plant that's easy to find this time of year. And it's often growing around these other plants like the chickweed and the creeping Charlie and the archangel. Um, it's got these pretty blue flowers and grows in mats. So, um, it's easy to find with these blue flowers and the scallop leaves. Um, this is drying and toning. It's a respiratory tonic. So eating the plant as a wild edible or drinking a tea made from the plant is toning to the respiratory system. It's helpful for congestion. Um, it helps to remove excess mucus. Traditionally has been used for coughs, um, asthma, pleurisy helps to relax tension in the body. Um, and you can use this in your salads. Um, I haven't really used this as a cooked green, but definitely as a fresh green in salads or to harvest and make tea with. Bittercress is another plant that's easy to find um, coming up. This is a mustard family plant. Um, and these mustard family plants are usually have the same growing pattern. They the leaves grow in a rosette, um, come in, which means it comes up from a central point and fans out. Um, and then the flowers are very teeny tiny white flowers. Most mustard family plants have four petals, um, regular shaped flowers. You can look for that. And all mustard family plants are, are safe. There's no real poisonous, dangerous plants in the mustard family. Um, there are very, very hot, spicy plants in the mustard family that may hurt your mouth if you eat them, but um, for the most part, safe to take a nibble from mustard family plants. And um, bittercress is very mild, has a mild peppery taste. This is a precious little tiny plant that um, coming up in the garden right now, but um, it's full of vitamin C and sulfur, which helps um, oxygen enter our cells, cells. And it's great in salads as a fresh green. Plantain, um, Plantago, there's a couple different species. We have, this is the broadleaf plantain and we also have the narrow leaf plantain as well. Um, all of the plantains have these long ribs going from the stem to the end of the leaf here. Um, and if you're not sure if you have plantain, you can always pick a leaf and these ribs um, have these little, um, almost looks like floss coming out the ends of them um, as a way to identify them, but pretty easy to identify this plant. Plantain is one of my favorite plants to use as a first aid plant because it is great at pulling out infection um, 
and healing up wounds and pulling out venom from stings and things like that. But plantain when it's young, like it is right now, this time of year is a great wild edible because you can eat these tender young leaves um, and they're very palatable. As they get bigger, like they are in the picture here, they get tougher and less palatable. But when eaten as a wild edible, um, vitamins C, E, K, boron, calcium, iron, libidinum, potassium, sulfur, it's high in protein. You can add them to smoothies, salads, soups. You can make a tea out of them. Um, it's healing to mucous membranes, healing to the gut lining. In fact, plantain tea is one of the main herbs we use when people have um, problems with the gut um, and the gut lining, things like leaky gut, um, where the gut lining needs to be healed. Um, it's also toning to the respiratory system. Violets are starting to come up right now. Um, and the violet leaves, when they are young and tender are edible and great to add to salads and smoothies or just eat out of hand. Violets are cooling and soothing. If you take a violet leaf and put it in your mouth and just chew on it and hold it in your mouth and just notice what's going on in your mouth, um, you'll notice that you start to have this cooling feeling. You start to have this, uh, a lot of moisture um, in your mouth and that's the mucilage in the violet leaves. So plants that contain mucilage, like violets, like marshmallow root, um, they're soothing and healing and cooling to the mucous membranes in our body. So all the way down our digestive system. Violets are also calming to our nerves um, and medicine for our emotional heart as well. Um, very high in vitamin C and vitamin A. In fact, vitamin um, violets have as much vitamin C per pound as, as oranges do, which people think are super high in vitamin C. So eating violet greens is a great way to get a lot of vitamin C. Violets are toning to the liver, the gallbladder, digestive system and urinary system, um, anti-cancer compounds with a special affinity for the breast. For breast tissue. The leaves and the flowers can be eaten um, fresh. These are violet leaves. Um, this is a photo I just took yesterday of the really tiny violets that are coming up in my garden. So a lot of people like to collect the flowers because they're so pretty and make syrups out of them and things like that. And that's that's beautiful and, and wonderful to do. But the violet leaves are an amazing medicine, um, both to eat and to, to drink as tea as well, or to turn into a vinegar. One of my favorite, favorite spring tonics um, this time of year is sweet birch. And um, I just love this tree. If you have birch trees growing around you, um, it's, this, it's wonderful to partake of this medicine this time of year. So you can collect birch leaves throughout the season and make tea out of them. Um, birch bark uh, is the traditional medicine and you can buy birch bark to make tea. Um, but if you have the, the trees growing around you, you can collect the leaves and make a mild tea that is great. But in the springtime, one of the great practices to do with birch is to collect the twigs. So this time of year when the sap is running and the trees really haven't begun to leaf out yet, um, you can take uh, you know, maybe four inches off of the tips of the branches and just collect those twigs and put them in a mason jar and pour boiling water over them and cover them and let them sit overnight. And in the morning you can drink the water and it has an amazing taste. It's very mild, very subtle, um, but you can definitely taste the, the wintergreen um, essential oil um, 
that is characteristic of sweet birch. So if you if you have sweet birch growing around you, um, you can go up to uh, the tree and kind of scratch off the outer bark and get to that inner bark and smell it. Um, and you'll have this, this wonderful wintergreen smell because um, birch and, and the plant wintergreen have the same volatile oil, so they smell the same. Um, and that's one way you can, you can also identify a birch if you're not sure if it's birch or something else. So it's the inner bark, the leaves and the twigs that are used as medicine. And birch is cleansing and dissolving. It's anti-inflammatory, anti-rheumatic. It's a mild pain reliever and it's great for stiff muscles. So we use this medicine as topical medicine, making infused oils and salves to rub on stiff muscles or painful areas in the body. But in the springtime, Birch can be a great springtime cleanser. And um, harvesting the twigs is a nice way to partake of this medicine without um, you know, taking a lot of bark off the tree. So I never harvest bark from you know, the trunks of the tree. If I'm going to harvest bark, it's always from pruned branches, but for birch, it's lovely just to take the tips of the, you know, a handful of tips of the twigs to make your tea with. And if you're going to do this, if you're going to make this springtime cleanser with birch, um, with the twigs, after you drink it, after you know it's been infusing overnight, you can keep those same twigs. You don't have to go out and harvest more. Keep those same twigs in the jar, heat up some more water and pour it over it and let it infuse again overnight. And you can do that for up to a week using the same twigs. And that's a nice springtime um, practice for cleansing. And here it is, the birch twigs in the jar. Um, I do this for my students in the springtime and it's, it's, it's just a wonderful tasting tea. Um, so fun. And then sassafras. So another, another tree um, that has traditionally been used as a spring tonic. Um, traditionally, the leaves were used in the fall and the root was used in the spring. So um, I say add to smoothies and salads. Um, I, that, that is not true. I don't add to smoothies and salads. So I'm gonna take that, that out of there so you can ignore this line. But it was traditionally used as a blood cleanser or an alternative. It's toning to the liver, the gallbladder, the stomach, the kidneys, the bowels and the bladder. Helpful for diarrhea, for dysentery, for skin problems, for gout and arthritis. Um, and this is the roots. So to make tea of sassafras roots, um, you can simmer them for 10 minutes. Uh, they combine well with dandelion root, burdock root, and spices like cardamom and anise. Um, you wanna avoid this if you're nursing. The thing about sassafras is it is illegal to sell for internal use. However, this plant has a long history um, of being used for as a, a tonic and an alternative um, especially in traditional Appalachian communities. The reason why it is illegal is because um, there's a compound in sassafras called safrol. And back in the seventies, it was injected in very high amounts into rats and found to cause liver cancer. Um, that's not how we use the plant in its whole form and um, saffron is not even water soluble. So if you're making a tea, sweetie, can you not do that please? If you're making a tea with sassafras, um, you're not even gonna get the saffron in the tea water. So, you know, it's, it's up to you whether you wanna take this internally. Um, I've, you know, every individual has to make that choice. 
But um, I found it interesting that I wrote an article about sassafras on my blog years back, and it was the most commented on blog post I ever had. And I had people from traditions that use this for generations in their family comment on it and, and say that they've had grandparents drinking sassafras tea you know, all their lives and live well into their 90s and great health and everything. So, you know, a traditional um, a medicine, you know, made in the traditional way does not work in, in the body the same way that laboratory tests, um, you know, are run. So it's one of those things you have to decide for yourself. But, um, but if you do decide you want to partake of sassafras um, and you want to go out and collect them, the sassafras tree has the three different kinds of leaves right? It has the regular leaves that are just lobe shaped, has the sh leaves that are mitten shaped, and then three uh, points on them. So it's very easy to identify when it is in leaf. And then when you crush those leaves and smell, smell the crushed leaves, it has an amazing uh, sassafras taste. Sassafras usually grows in stands, not, not just one tree by itself, but a whole group of trees growing together. And those uh, group of trees are usually one organism connected by their root systems underground. Um, so some herbalists will recommend if you want to gather the roots yourself, you can find two trees growing near each other and dig in between them and you will find the connecting root and you can harvest a piece of that root without killing either tree and they'll both continue to grow. So before I ended today, I thought I would um, go over some instructions on making herbal vinegars because this is a great way to use some of these plants that are really high in vitamins and minerals that are coming up in the springtime. Herbal vinegars was a common way of making um, tinctures before we had access to high quality um, alcohol. Um, and what's great about vinegar is it's really, really effective at extracting vitamins and minerals from the plants. And vinegar is a food itself as well. So if you want to preserve some of these plants to use as food, um, making an infused vinegar is a great way to do it. Um, vinegar is characterized by the presence of acetic acid. And so we refer to infused vinegars as acetas. Um, one thing that you have to be aware of when you're infusing herbs and vinegar is that the acetic acid is the preservative. And in order to make a successful herbal vinegar or aceta, it's important to not raise the water to acetic acid ratio too much. So for this reason, many herbalists recommend only using dried herbs when infusing in vinegar. Um, but I found in my own practice that as long as you wilt the herbs a little bit and let a lot of their water content evaporate off, then you can usually get an effective um, and well-preserved aceta. So if I am harvesting fresh plant material to infuse in vinegar, I'll go out and harvest it on a dry, sunny day, and I'll put it in a basket and I'll set it either in the shade or bring it in the house and let it sit for six to 12 hours and just let some of that water content evaporate off and let the plant material wilt a little bit. Okay, so making an infused vinegar with, dry, with a fresh plant material, um, you wanna harvest on a dry day after the dew has evaporated. I don't wash the plants um, because again, you gotta be careful about water content. So. I make sure I'm harvesting from clean um, areas where um, you know, the plants are fine, they don't need to be washed. And then I wilt the plants in a basket, let some of that water content evaporate. 
Once the plants are wilted, I'll go ahead and chop them up coarsely and then I'll put them in a jar. So if you're using freshly wilted plant material, you wanna fill your jar about three quarters of the way full. If you're using dried herbs, only fill your jar halfway because those dried herbs are gonna reconstitute and expand and fill up the space. Um, so you want to, to not put as much in. And then add your vinegar. So you can add any kind of vinegar you want. Apple cider vinegar is really great for this. I'm using red wine vinegar in this example. Um, the only vinegar that I don't recommend you using is white vinegar that's not organic because white vinegar, um, sometimes there's a chemical process that's used if it's not organic. So, but if you're using organic, that's fine. Um, it's up to you which kind you want. And then cap your jar. Um, if you're using a metal cap, you'll want to put a piece of wax paper between the vinegar and the lid um, so that the vinegar doesn't corrode the metal. And then make sure you put a label on it so you don't forget what you have and the date. And you're gonna let it infuse for two to four weeks. And you can go ahead and give that jar a shake every day to get the vinegar in there and mix it all up um, so it can help extract everything from your herbs. And then after two, two weeks, you can go ahead and strain out your herbs and put your vinegar in a bottle and label it and use it um, any way you would vinegar for, for recipes or salad dressings or just taking by the spoonful as a daily tonic. So that brings me to the end of my presentation here. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, um, this is Michael Lamb. Um, April, can you tell us about upcoming uh, educational events that you're doing? Because I, you're really great at uh, putting this information out and I'm sure other people would be interested in hearing about what's coming up in in your work. Yeah, I have um, I have a class coming up later this month um, on seasonal allergies and herbal strategies for both preventing and dealing with um, symptoms of seasonal allergies in the moment. So I have um, I have, the, this class is actually, the allergy class is actually offered two different, there's two different ways you can get access to that. You can join my Patreon um, as a subscriber and you'll just automatically be enrolled and get access to future classes as well as all the posts I write every month for my Patreon people. Or if you just wanna take that class by itself, you can send me an email um, nettlejuice at gmail.com and I'll get you registered just for that class um, on its own. That's the only class I have coming up, but I will be posting more throughout the season as we, we move forward through the year. And I'm, I'm open, like right now, I'm open to hearing what people want, you know, what kind of classes people want. I think, um, I think a salve making class is in the works as well. I have a question. This is Deb. Okay. Uh, well, Hi, I two, Hi. I have two questions. Uh, back with the, the dead nettle plant, I saw on your list that it was good for um, varicose veins. Would that be like making a poultice or drinking a tea or? Yeah, for, for varicose veins, it would be more effective if it were used externally at the site. You know, the, the closer you can get the plant material to the local, you know, site of the issue, the better, the more effective it's going to be. So you can make a poultice. You can also make a tea and strain it out and soak a cloth in there to do a compress, do it that way. Um, infuse 
in infused oils and rub it on that up on the area like that. But the, the big thing is to get it on there as often as you can. Oh, okay. Uh, the other question I had was about birch. I have, I don't, I don't think I have that uh, sweet birch, but I have a, a white paper birch. Can you do that with the twigs of that one or? Yeah, I don't think the paper birch has the wintergreen essential oil in it. Yeah, okay. I, I'm, yeah, I've never used paper birch, so I'm not familiar with, with it, but I don't think it has the wintergreen the way the, the sweet birch does. Where does that sweet birch usually grow? I, I'm not really, is it a wetland plant? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it prefers, Dale, do you know? Does it prefer wet areas? Second, there we go, unmuted myself. Uh, no, uh, you know, it seems like from here north or here up into the mountains, it's common. Here in the mm, Piedmont, it's not as common. If you go up to French Creek, it's everywhere. And just look for the birches and start smelling the twigs. Oh, it, it, it's just not super common right right here unless you run a, a hill or mountain and a average to dry area. But uh, we have buddies that have it. Uh, Sid and Lenny, uh, for one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, when I've when I've come across birch in the in the wild, it's I in my experience, it seems to like to grow on hillsides. Okay, that's where I usually find it. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, hi, my name is Chris. Hi, Chris. Uh, about uh, the red nettle or purple nettle, you had also mentioned it can be helpful for seasonal allergies. Would you use that as a tea? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be a great way to take it, to just harvest a little bit every day, um, chop it up, add it to a mason jar, boil some water, pour it over, and let it steep for maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then strain it out and drink one to two cups of tea every day. If you start doing that now, when you get, I, my seasonal allergies come on like the second week of May. So if I'm preparing, you know, for allergy season, I will start now, beginning of April. Mm -hmm. I've, I've got uh, not so much a, a, well, it is a question, and that's whether uh, you'd like to have another story about the dandelion. I loved your dandelion story, uh, but I learned another story about the dandelions. Oh, I'd love to hear it. Um, this story has it that the dandelions were native uh, to the Middle East, about up as far as the edge of Turkey. And that with one of the uh, pilgrimages that went to the Middle East, they brought the dandelion back through France and, and into England. And when they saw the roots of it, they thought it looked like tea. Uh, and since it was Richard the Lionheart bringing them back, they were referred to as the tooth of the lion, or in French, Don de Leon. So I, I don't know if there's any truth to it, but that's the story I heard. That's interesting. Yeah. So Richard the Lionhearted is credited with bringing dandelion. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he get stuck in a tower somewhere for several years on his way back? <laughs> He had some well, there's all kinds of stories of the pilgrimage, and I don't know how many pilgrimages there were, and whether it was actually Richard or somebody in his party that brought them back. <laughs> That's generally the, the name, Don de Leon. Mm -hmm. That's great. One more question, April. Mm -hmm. um, I got to show you something. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> 
Oh, see that ugly red uh, wound on there? <laughs> I'm going to go and uh, make some chickweed, uh, not salve, come on, poultice. And I'll, I'll give you a report. <laughs> All right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, slip away, but I really love this. Thanks, April. and everybody. Yes, it's really wonderful to have you. Oh, thanks for having me, everyone. Thanks for coming. Blessings. Um, when I see all these bees, I, I think about my bees visiting them. And the and the purple dead nettle, you get a a beautiful red. Um, and what they sometimes do is um, petals get stuck to the bee or something. I always see like this beautiful purple uh, petal in the in the comb. <laughs> they bring it into the hive, it gets stuck in, on them, and it's just really sweet. I love, I love that um, between the color of the pollen and the petals in the hive, it's okay. really nice. And of course, the dandelions and all. Mm. Um, yeah. but, um, I, I sometimes confuse the purple dead nettle, and I hear people uh, talking about red pollen from henbit. Is that a, another herb that gets confused with dead nettle or I just don't know the difference. Yeah, no, hen, henbit is often con confused with dead nettle. Henbit doesn't grow anywhere around me at all. So I don't really use that myself and I'm not as familiar with it as a plant as I am with, with the ones that I've talked about today. But yeah, it's very similar. It has a little bit of a different growing pattern, a little bit of a different leaf shape, but um but it's often confused with dead nettle. Another mint family plant, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and I wonder um, too about the bees visiting these flowers from these early springtime weeds and then the honey from those, from those bees and how much of that medicine you know, is in that honey as well. important foods for the bees, right, this time of year. Yeah, um, the, the earliest flowers, I think there's such an explosion in the population. I, a lot of it goes, you know, uh, hand to mouth kind of thing. They, they use they, it, yeah. They use it very quickly. Um, but I, I wonder if the pollen gets mixed in there too. Uh, you know, you, it was in my mind when you're talking about the allergy medicine and uh, I was wondering about the pollen and if the honey would help in, in that way. But these really early flowers, we rarely uh, harvest that honey because uh, the bees, yeah. It's a bee's food. I was thrilled to, to find out what that plant is. The dead nettle is all in my garden. And I was just saying to someone, do you know what this is? Is there any use for it? Because it's everywhere. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? I had two quick questions. Um, I know you said that red clover should be avoided during pregnancy. Are all the others clear to go then? Yeah, let me just think really quick. Probably sassafras would be avoided as well. But um, yeah, dandelion, all of the, the most, of, most of the plants we talked about are considered food as medicine, right? So my teacher, Thomas, has this system of classifying herbs um, level one through four. So level one herbs are, you know, they're food as medicine. We could eat them as food. That's how safe they are. And level two would be, you know, maybe we'd spice our food with it, but we wouldn't eat a whole uh, meal. So that would be like oregano, sage, stuff like that. Level three would be things like yarrow, like Michael Ann mentioned in the beginning that are just medicine. We wouldn't really eat them in level four toxic plants. So all of the plants that we talked about with the exception of, you know, birch and sassafras um, are either level one or level two. So they're very safe, you know, either food or, 
or spice, you know, flavoring. Thank you. Um, my second question was um, the the creeping Charlie as a um, to help with um, lead toxicity. So um, my daughter Zora at her one month one year checkup tested high for lead, and she's fine now. But I was just wondering, um, like, how early would you give a, a little? some, this kind of medicine, if that was a concern? Um, for kids, uh, when they're able to drink, you know, drinks on their own, I, I, for my own kids, even I would dilute teas and give it to them, like just dilute teas with water and give it to them a little bit, you know, lower strength. Then, then I would take it. But yeah, I, I've given, you know, teas and even tinctures to my kids when they were really young, just diluted and in lower doses. But yeah, this um, Creeping Charlie is, is pretty safe. The one thing I will say about, about Creeping Charlie though, because it does have a tendency for lead and pull lead is that you do have to be careful where you harvest it from. So you don't want to be harvesting it from soil that may be contaminated with lead either, you know, because you know, you may have it. But you know, these plants are bioremediators, right? They don't just heal our bodies, but they also heal the earth as well. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't talk about that at all, but wherever these plants are growing, and they usually grow in just, you know, these weeds grow in disturbed soil or depleted soil or hard pan, things like that. They're, they're breaking up the soil, they're bringing up minerals and nutrients from the, you know, the subsoils and depositing it back on the ground. And they're making the soil more friable with their roots. And they're, they're cleaning the earth, just like they clean our bodies. You know, they're, they're spring tonics for the, for the earth too, which is so cool. It's such a shame they're vilified. Thank you, April. Any one more question? Oh, okay. So. I think maybe we'll wrap up then. Um, I think this was a really spectacular presentation, um, very inspiring. And I highly recommend going to um, um, April's website, um, either Nettle Juice, oh gosh, nettlejuice.com or her Patreon. Um, and you can also email her, and that's all in the chat box. Uh, at gmail.com. So, oh, there's a question in the chat. Okay. Do you know of any of these plants safe for cats? Yeah, cats are tricky because their their kidneys are so much more sensitive than our kidneys. So, a lot of the plants that are safe for humans are not safe for plants for cats at all. So I, I am not an expert on using herbs for animals and I don't, I don't feel confident, um, you know, giving advice on, on herbs for cats, but I do know that you have to um, use a lot more caution with cats because their kidneys are so much more sensitive than ours. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Hope to meet you sometime. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll um, thank you for recording and put a link on our, our website at schooloflivingcom and or you can email us. Dot org. Dot org. I'm sorry. Um, and we'll send you the link. And I think that's it for us. Bye. Thank you, April. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Go eat your weed. Bye. Yeah, go eat your weed. <laughs> <laughs> Good night.
Good night. Good night.